to on, on behalf of the Ute Light Corporation and all the other expanded shale clay and slate producers across the United States, welcome to our broadcast entitled Internal Curing, Curing Concrete from the Inside Out and what you should know as you design concrete projects for your clients going forward. By way, of, by way of introduction, my name is Ken Nunley. I work for Ute Light Corporation in Salt Lake City, Utah, just east of Park City. and have worked in the cement and concrete industry for all of my career. I began right out of college working for what is now Holcim Lafarge Cement Company, sold cement for 22 years, then went to work in the ready mix industry as a sales manager for Harper Ready Mix in Salt Lake. I sold structural fibers for a couple of years before joining the concrete and aggregate sales team with AltaView Concrete in Salt Lake City. And since 2008, have worked for Ute Light in technical sales, service, and marketing. I'm not an engineer. I don't profess to be an engineer, but I've been around cement and concrete long enough to understand the chemistry and how internal curing can improve the performance of all the concrete that you design for your clients, customers, or other users. So with that, we'll get started. As I mentioned, internal curing, curing concrete from the inside out, what does this do for us? Well, it improves the performance of concrete by improving the durability and sustainability, increasing the surface life. How nice would it be to design a concrete structure for 20 years and instead of costly rehabilitation projects at 10 or 12 years, we, we add service life. We get to 25 or 30 years. And we can do this simply and cost effectively by adhering to ASTM C1761, the standard for internal curing. As my duties with Ute Light take me across the Western US, we oftentimes meet with the DOTs and I recently gave a presentation to the good folks at Utah Department of Transportation and and I jokingly said all these signs as we enter Utah welcoming the motoring public to Utah right next to it or, or a short distance away we should have this sign on the right because it seems that every summer this is what we're involved in. And, th and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. I understand the motoring public uh, desires and demands good roadways, smooth pavements, and everything else. But is there a better way? Are we building with durable and sustainable products? Are we adding service life to the projects that we design? You know, in, in a word, the short answer is no. I, I don't believe that we are. I, I believe that instead of adding service life, we keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And we all know what that definition is. But I pose this question, why are we so resistant to change? Why do we keep using outdated technology when it comes to our concrete design. Here's a, theoretic, here's a theoretical question for you. Why, why do we resist the change? Why are we so resistant to it? 
Is it fear? Or are we afraid of retribution from our bosses or management? Do we not understand the costs involved in maintenance for concrete? Do we believe that trying to do something better will cost too much and be cost prohibitive? Do we simply lack the information? It's one of those, you don't know what you don't know. I hope it's not D. I hope we haven't uh, gotten to the point where we're marking the big calendar on our wall with red X as each day passes, just waiting to uh, retire. And so we don't really care what happens. Or, or is it a combination of all? Do all things kind of go into this resistance and we don't want to try something different? Because just trying something new uh, will amaze you at, at what you can accomplish. Now, when I snapped this photo at Rockport Reservoir near our plant one day while I was fishing, I thought to myself, well, that's really not much of a trick for the dolphin, but for the cow, that's a pretty notable accomplishment. So if we don't limit ourselves from trying new things, as I mentioned, we will oftentimes amaze ourselves at what can be accomplished. Here's a concrete reality. Concrete shrinks. It's like saying the sun comes up in the east. Everyone knows that. Everyone who's produced concrete, designed concrete, finished concrete, has anything to do with concrete knows that concrete shrinks. And from this shrinkage comes cracking. And the chemical shrinkage and the autogenous shrinkage begins as soon as the water begins to hydrate the cement particles. And the more hydration that takes place, the larger the volume change becomes. And then we get dry and shrinkage and early age shrinkage, which leads to micro cracks as the concrete hasn't had time to adequately develop enough tensile strength to withstand this shrinkage. So increasing concrete durability is simply a matter of finding out how we can control cracks. When I go to uh, engineering offices, DOT offices, all those kind of things, oftentimes this resistance to change and people say, well, you know what? I've been doing this for a long time. I've been, I've been designing concrete for 20 years. I've been finishing concrete. I've been producing concrete for a long time. And so if I haven't heard about internal curing, I, I don't know that I'm really interested in learning about it at all. But I'm here to tell you that this magic bullet known as internal curing will improve your concrete performance. It will improve the hydration, making more efficient use of the cement and the supplemental cementitious materials that we put in concrete today. It'll reduce the width of the cracks. It'll increase the strength of the concrete. It will improve the durability by adding service life. You'll get less shrinkage cracks for large box store floors. Uh, warehouse type things, you'll get less curling and warping at the joints. For outside concrete, you'll get increased durability through reduced permeability, which will prevent the salts and the other chlorides that we put on the top of our site concrete from getting into the reinforcing steel. And we all know that sometimes curing concrete is kind of an afterthought. We kind of do a poor job of surface curing, but it will help offset pure cure, poor curing and also improve those contractors that go the extra mile and do good curing techniques. It will improve that as well, all under ASTM, C1761. Now, as we go around the Western US and, and here 
in our home state of Utah. Uh, ACI came up originally with their definition of internal caring. This was probably in about 1999 or 2000. Supplying water through a freshly placed cementitious mixture using reservoirs. Now, when people heard, well, how am I supposed to get a reservoir in my concrete slab or my tilt up wall, my bridge deck? What are you talking about? They think, do I have to inject concrete with water? And so they were they were put off a little bit by it. They didn't understand it. It was brand new, so to speak. And so then they said, well, how, how can this be? I just, I just don't understand how I'm supposed to get a reservoir in my concrete. And then we started talking about self-desiccation and those kind of things. And we all know, is this fake news? Then in 2013, they said, Internal curing is such a simple process. Let's simplify our definition, which they then said is simply a process by which hydration of cement particles continues due to the availability of internal water, which is what they initially called reservoirs, but it is not part of the mixing water. So we will not compromise the water to cement ratio. The water will come from lightweight aggregates, which have absorbed 17 or 20 percent of their weight in water. And even our friend Boris said, well, that's that's relatively easy. I think I can understand that. So here's how lightweight aggregates are produced and, and where these reservoirs, so to speak, hold the water. We mine raw material in Utah. We happen to have a shale deposit, but in other parts of the United States, clay or slate is also uh, mined. We put it through a kiln somewhere around 2000 degrees, much the same as the production of cement. Uh, cement is about 3000 to 3200 degrees. Lightweight expanded shale, clay or slate aggregates or about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, less than that. Then as the material is softened as it makes its way through the kiln, these gas bubbles are formed. And as these gas bubbles form, due to the perfect chemistry in the raw material, they create a void in the aggregate. And then the gas bubbles remain after they're cooled and we produce holy raw. Now, what do those air voids do for the lightweight aggregate? Well, you get twice the volume for the same mass. This picture here shows 25 tons of typical limestone aggregate, 25 tons of expanded shale lightweight aggregate. So you can see, while each weigh 25 tons, the volume in the lightweight is substantially larger. This map shows the lightweight producers across the United States. As I mentioned, Ute Light is here in Utah, east of Salt Lake City and Park City on I-80. There's a plant in Boulder, Colorado, and a plant uh, north of Los Angeles in Fraser Park in the western U.S. Now, in concrete, just like in all living things, no water is no bueno. And we talked about self-desiccation. That's a big word that simply means that the mixing water in our concrete is being used up so rapidly as the hydration of the Portland cement particles takes place that there's not enough left to cover the surfaces. And so oftentimes we get unhydrated particles in our concrete. So the very most expensive thing in the art of concrete is cement. And it's, 
it's going to waste. It's unhydrated. We've seen this under a microscope under XRD. And as I mentioned, the most expensive thing is going to waste. This also leads no water, no bueno, also leads to autogenous shrinkage. This happens typically in early age concrete where we get lower and lower water cement ratios. All of the available water is being drawn to the hydration of the cement materials. And so we get an early age shrinkage and these small capillaries collapse when left unfilled, which cause micro cracks at early ages. Now, chemical shrinkage, that happens when the volume of cement is hydrated and there's nothing to replace that volume change. So think of it if we're gonna make lemonade. So here we have a picture of our water and lemon concentrate, and now we're gonna put in three cups of sugar. Well, that three cups of sugar represents a volume. And as that sugar dissolves, or like our cement, is it hydrates, what replaces that volume? If there's nothing left to, to replace that volume, then we get a, a shrinkage caused by the chemical reaction and volume changes as we know at early ages causes cracking. Here's a different picture of uh, what we've seen under the microscope. The cement particles are much smaller than the lightweight aggregate particles, and so the largest pores will empty first. So we pre-wet the lightweight aggregate. You saw the holy rocks where the reservoirs were. They fill with water. And then as the cement paste begins to hydrate, it pulls the water from the aggregate to maintain that volume. Here's a fact. If we can control the water, we can control the cracking. Just like our friend here, we need to get the water where we need it, and we get the we need to get the water to do what we, it is that we want it to do. Now we can see with the use of supplementary cementitious materials, fly ash, silica fume, slag, we've done a good job at densifying the surface of the concrete, making it so that we have external water for curing, but it can't even penetrate more than a few millimeters. So if we have a six inch or a seven inch, a nine inch slab, how do we get curing water inside that concrete? How do we control the water like our friend here? Well, here's how we do it. We need to, first of all, create a Goldilocks effect. We can't use a moisture carrier that gives up the water too fast because if, if we have something that has absorption of 17% moisture, for instance, and it gives it up too fast, now we have compromised the water cement ratio. Now, instead of being 0.45, we might be 0.50. And of course, that will have a detrimental effect on our compressive strength then we can't have a moisture carrier that gives up the water too late. We've seen what happens if the volume change takes place because there's no available water. So if the water is pulled out of our moisture carrier too late, then we'll get early age shrinkage, then we'll get early age cracking, and we don't want that. So we have to have a moisture carrier that gives up the water at exactly the right time. And that right time is when the relative humidity falls below 94%. Research has proven that concrete with relative humidities 94% and above still continue to hydrate. When we fall below that, there's not enough moisture, and that's when the early age cracking uh, takes place. Now, here's a fact the best way to reduce shrinkage is to reduce the paste fraction of the mix. The only thing that shrinks in concrete is the cement paste. The rocks and the sand don't shrink. They can't shrink. So the only thing that's shrinking 
is the glue that we made from cement and water. And if we reduce the percentage of the paste fraction in our mix, it stands to reason it's a physical characteristic that we will do shrinkage. So now we've had this misconstrued conception for 35 years. As I mentioned, I sold cement for 22 years. And early in my career, HPC, high performance concrete, was the buzzword throughout the concrete construction industry. We're going to improve the density. We're going to make it hard for those chlorides to get inside uh, the concrete to the reinforcing steel. We're going to limit the penetration of water on the surface, which is our external curing. But it also resulted in more cracking. Because what we wanted to do is we lower the water cement ratio. Say we go to 0.35 or 0.38, we take all the water out and we add more cement. So as I mentioned, I was a young and eager cement salesman. I go, yeah, let's do that. Let's add cement to everything that we make. Well, we can see now with 35 years of clarity that uh, we cause more problems than we ever hope to solve because Think about it. When's the last time you've ever had a legitimate problem in a concrete project that was due to compressive strain? Concrete is very good in compression. The cements do a very good job of making concrete that will withstand compression. Where we get performance issues is because of the durability. It fails long before its intended service life. And lowering the water cement ratio by adding cement and taking out water was probably one of the worst things that we could do. So we add more cement, we take out water, lower the water cement ratio, and what happens? Here's these three uh, principles again. We get self-desiccation, we get autogenous shrinkage, we get chemical shrinkage. Now, when you see a crack from this point forward, if you take nothing else from this presentation, when you see a crack in concrete and you, you know that it, the concrete thirsted to death, we created skeletons, which are the cracks, because there wasn't enough water in them. We didn't do a good job of getting the water where we needed it to be. And so we caused the cracks. Henry LaChatelier, a long time ago, uh, came up with chemical shrinkage and self desiccation. As I mentioned, I'm a business major, so even I could understand this math. One part water, one part cement equals two. One plus one equals two. Well, Henry said, not so fast, my friend. One plus one equals about 1 1.8 because of chemical shrinkage. Think back to the lemonade. What happens when the sugar dissolved? What replaced that volume? Well, that volume change is up to 20%. Now, here are the properties of the expanded aggregates, the vitrified ceramic material. They make very strong concrete, as strong as you need it to be, 4,000, 5,000. We've made 9,800 PSI in 16 hours in pre-stress. Uh, operations so we, we can make the concrete as strong as you need it to be using lightweight aggregates. The pores reduce the density but they're not interconnected and we've proven this. Remember when we made the holy rocks? Well here's a test that they did through the research of internal curing proving that the, these voids in the surface of the material are not interconnected so they're not hollow tubes. They don't allow the water to go all the way through to the middle or the other side of the aggregate. And how they did this is they put lightweight aggregate in a solution with yellow dye. And they soaked this aggregate for 180 days. Then after six months, the aggregate was cracked open, put under a black light, and you could see that all the moisture was held and there's about 15% absorption by mass on the surface. You don't see that yellow dye going all the way through the aggregate. That's how we maintain the strength 
That's how we maintain the structural integrity, but still have absorption 15 to 20%. As I mentioned, I was in the ready mix business uh, two different times, and the absorption on our aggregates are typically one to one and a half percent. I've even seen some in the dolomitic limestones that are 0.3%, three tenths of 1% absorption. So the lightweight aggregates, much more absorptive, but it's on the surface. Now, here's this same test, the yellow dye soaked into the surface of the aggregate. And as the cement began to hydrate, our Goldilocks effects, giving it up at just the right time, pulling the, the moisture from the aggregate into the paste, thereby preventing the chemical shrinkage, the early age shrinkage, and the resultant cracking that comes from that volume change at early ages. This is a uh, Dale Bentz and Jason Weiss. When Jason, Dr. Weiss was at Purdue University, Dale Bentz was with NIST, and this is just particle size distribution. It's the same volume of lightweight aggregate, only a diff just different gradation. This is larger gradation. This is the sand particles. You can see that even though there's water in it, because of the larger gradation, there aren't enough particles. This white represents unhydrated cement. This is the skeletons forming because they're thirsting to death. There isn't enough water available. All around the lightweight aggregate pieces, the moisture is being pulled out, but there's not enough of them to go around. Here are the sand particles, much smaller. You can see there's no skeletons. All of cement is adequately, uh, the thirst is adequately quenched and everything has been hydrated, which also improves the performance of the cement. Because now, because more cement hydrates, we get increased compressive strains. This just shows another one at all water cement ratios. The tan represents the percentage of cement hydration. This is normal white concrete with no internal curing, less cement hydration. As I mentioned, uh, it's a mature technology. It's been around for a long time. Purdue University, Auburn, University of Texas, Oregon State, Many others, uh, National Institute of Science and Technology. There's this is probably 200 citations now as far as research regarding internal curing. So if you just go to this website, you'll be able to pull up, just Google internal curing and you'll get all kinds of uh, technical papers and research projects for you to review. Now it's very simple. Uh, the research has proven that we need seven pounds of water per hundred weight of cement. So in a seven bag mix, oh, like I said, math's not my strong suit. Seven bag mix at seven pounds of water would be 49 pounds of internal water. And this is the desorption and the absorption of the lightweight material, which the suppliers will easily provide and it comes down to about 30% or 300 pounds of lightweight aggregate per cubic yard of concrete to get the full benefit of internal curing. So again, ASTM C1761 includes a calculator for determining the volume of lightweight aggregate needed. And every lightweight aggregate producer can also help the ready mix producer come up with the mix design as well. Now, well, as we said, limiting our ability to try limits our ability to achieve new things. So just give it a try. Here's some projects that have used internal curing successfully here in Salt Lake City, 1300 South. This is the railroad. Uh, viaduct over the mainline UP Railroad going south out of Salt Lake. It's a two block long. It's from 5th West to 7th West, right there by Larry H. Miller Ford, where the Jazz have their basketball practice facility. 
we needed to put the bike lane and pedestrian lane outside the traffic lane. So the deck was demolished, used the same substructure and superstructure. And the deck was in such disrepair that it was completely uh, water blasted out with the water cannon and down to the girders and started over. And Darren Fernell, the Salt Lake City engineer, said, let's give it a try. So he consulted with Parson Brinkerhoff, which is now WSP uh, engineers, Granite Construction, who was the general contractor, Altaview Concrete, Borox who were engineering were the testing lab. And he said, let's go for it. Let's, let's give it a shot. He said, I'm gonna put internal curing to the test. He designed this bridge two blocks long with no joints to the point that Lee Young, the superintendent for Granite Construction, said, wait a minute. I'm not going to put no joints in two blocks of a bridge deck unless you sign off on a hold harmless saying that it's nothing to do with Granite Construction. So they drafted the hold harmless agreement. Salt Lake City Corporation signed it. and. It worked wonderfully well for the reasons that we've talked about. UDOT got on board. They built the flyover bridges on Bangator Highway from 70th South to about 118th South. They wanted to be more like I-15 instead of an urban arterial. About 8,300 cubic yards of concrete using lightweight sand. Now this is structural lightweight concrete, but we use sand to get full benefit internal curing it worked out wonderfully well this is a 4,000 psi specification the field test came back at over 6,000 they have a 650 flexural strength requirement we got almost 100 psi over that in flexural strength so worked out very well of course they're still in service today now Innovators make things happen. Here's a story of the Denver Water Authority. They build huge, huge water tanks in and around the suburbs of Denver. 10 million, 12 million, they build a 20 million gallon tank and said, we had such a problem losing water because of the cracking in our tanks. It, it's unbelievable how much water we would lose just simply because of the cracks that would develop in these tanks. So this was a very simple test as they decided to use internal curing. Uh, Eric Holt, E-R-I-K-H-O-L-C-K, was a design engineer for Denver Water Authority. You can Google that, Denver Water Authority, internal curing. His name will come up. He does about a five or six minute video testimonial saying how well internal curings work for them. Uh, but early on, he just designed internal curing in the floors and in the roof of these tanks. The walls were just slip formed, or excuse me, form and poured and didn't have internal curing initially. So Eric said, Kent, how, how do I know that these, that internal curing will work? Well, he just did a very simple test. Um, scraped out a flat spot, threw up some two befores. There was some concrete left over from the pour. The concrete representative called his dispatcher, said, do you have any trucks going back to the plant that have concrete on them? Of course they did. So they poured this. Now this was in the middle of August in Denver at about 95 degrees ambient temperature and about 10% relative humidity. So perfect opportunity for concrete to shrink in a hurry and cause cracking. Well, this was poured late in the afternoon the next morning at about 16 or 17 hours. Which one to you looks like it still has moisture in it? Which one to you looks like the cement is still hydrating and which one has dried out in 16 hours? If you look closely, we, the photo doesn't show up, but there were cracks already forming. We didn't put any joints in it because we wanted to do the same thing show the, the tendency to shrink and the effects of it. This is in uh, Oregon near Biggs Junction. 
Spanish Hollow. They wanted the, the historical beauty of this bridge. The deck was completely deteriorated, so they did the same thing. They water blasted the deck, replaced it with internal curing. This was in 2019. Here's the concrete on the deck. It looks just like concrete that you design with every day with that one small modification. And you can see that uh, compressive strength, 6,200. So these other tests are RCP, have permeability tests, very low permeability, very no cracking. It's in service today. So does it work? You tell me, Which here's the cylinders from this. Which ones look like even out of a cylinder mold? Which one dried out, which one didn't? Now, here's what internal curing is not. It's not lightweight concrete. I'm, I mentioned that uh, we used it on the, on the Bangor Highway bridges just because we wanted internal curing, but that was a lightweight concrete specification. Lightweight concrete typically is written 110 pounds per cubic foot plus or minus three. Normal weight concrete is 145 to 150 pounds per cubic foot. So internal curing will take 150 pound per cubic foot concrete to about 147. So it's still classified normal weight or heavyweight concrete. Internal curing does not cause a problem in the water cement ratio. We don't change the water cement ratio. You saw the compressive strengths both projects over 6,000, and we typically see that on a 4,000 design, we're well in excess of the specified water cement ratio. If the water cement ratio was compromised, the strengths wouldn't be where we see them. It's not a replacement for uh, the surface curing. Whatever surface curing you do with the spray on fogs, wet burlap, putting up wind uh, fences or wind guards, anything you can do to prevent moisture from leaving that concrete uh, too soon is what we recommend. So don't think because you use internal curing, well, I don't have to do any other curing. Just continue to do what you do now and internal curing will help the performance of those curing practices. And internal, internal curing is not a theory. It doesn't it, it's not a wish. It's not something that someone thought up and said, we think this will work. As I mentioned, all kinds of, it's been researched to death. It's shelf ready technology. Pull it off the shelf, ASTM C1761, specify that in your concrete. Now, rhetorical question, who makes phone calls with this? Who listens to music with this or this? Is this your big screen TV? You still drive this? Uh, although if we had a 1960 Metropolitan, it might be worth some money. Is this how we take our photos? Is this how you do your laptop or desktop computing? Is this when you need a calculator? Is this what you plug in? Obviously not. It's a, it's absurd to think that we would use continue to use this technology when technology advancements are such that we can do pretty much all of these same things with one device. But yet, when it comes to concrete, we can't grab this fast enough. It's the way we've always done it, so it's the way we're going to continue to do it. And now you know that technology advancements have made this obsolete as well. As most of us have been listening to webinars, recently I heard Dr. John Kevin, who is the um, department chair of civil engineering at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And he was talking about innovations in concrete technology from the past 30 years. So from 1990 to 2020, he listed these five and discussed them. 
these five topics and discuss them. This is not a ranking. It's just how he happened to list them in his presentation and internal curing is included. He said, I don't know why anyone would pour a yard of concrete that wasn't internally cured in 2020. And I must say, I agree with Dr. Tedder. I don't understand why it would happen either. Now, the criteria that he used for making his top five list, of course, it, it couldn't be a, uh, a theory. It had to be measurable and quantifiable. You had to be able to measure the performance in terms of increased cement hydration, reduction in shrinkage, which reduces the cracks, the length, the width, the overall cracking of, say, a bridge deck. All of those must be measurable and then must be quantifiable. Has to be repeatable as well. Have to be able to do it time and time and time again. Well, we all things uh, calculated, internal curing makes the list. These are some uses for internal curing. Tilt ups, large warehouse floors. You could increase the joint spacing. If you're spacing at 15 feet, go to 18, go to 20. Put less joints in your warehouse floor. The robotic forklifts, the human driven forklifts, Everything about reducing the joints means less maintenance and smoother rides. We don't get this kind of thing in our joints because even though it's jointed, the volume change happened too quickly. So this is what we get in our driveways without internal curing, our tilt-up panels, our road barriers. Here's what we get when we do use internal curing, or here's what we could get when you specify internal curing. Now, the economics, it has to be cost effective. So typically in a yard of concrete, we're just gonna use a thousand pounds to make the math for this business major easy. It's, we said it's about 30% replacement. So 300 pounds is all we need to have to get full benefit in internal curing. Here's the total sand. We're going to replace that about 30% with pre wetted lightweight sand. Now, say the, the lightweight aggregate costs $100 a ton. It, it's less than that along the Wasatch Front. Depending where you're located, and it has to be railed or trucked, it, you know, freight is going to be increased. So let's just say it's $100 a ton. At $100 a ton, that's a nickel a pound. So we have 300 pounds of five cents. That's $15 per cubic yard of concrete. Now, I wanna say that the premium may be more than that because the ready mix producer has to handle the material, has to pre-wet it, has to sprinkle it, has to do some things in his yard. So there, there are some, some uh, preparation that has to go into it. This is just a pure stand, from the pure standpoint of material costs. Now, remember, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the old Fram oil filter. The guy's working on an engine where the pistons had seized because there wasn't enough oil. It's one of those, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Well, it's the same thing with internal curing. You can pay a small price up front to increase the service life of your concrete, or you can pour it without, and before the service life is reached, you can pay later for the rehabilitation or the tear out and replacement altogether. As, as we said, does it work? Now, given what you now know about internal curing, what will keep you from using it on your next project? You certainly have nothing to fear. You've seen the strengths. You've seen how easy it is. You've seen the cost. It's relatively uh, negligible, inexpensive. It's the best. $20 a yard of concrete you could ever hope to spend. You certainly have uh, some information and you know where to get more on the NIST website. I know that you're not apathetic or you wouldn't be on this web uh, webinar now. So let's say that it's none of the above. I'm already thinking about where I can use internal curing on my next project. 
As I mentioned, my name is Ken Nunley. Uh, my counterpart, Darren Medeiros, and I both work in the concrete and internal curing for Ute We have horticulture projects or products, water filtration project products that Scott Jensen oversees. Bern Mort Mortensen handles asphalt uh, road chips and those kind of asphalt road maintenance and geotechnical backfill using lightweight aggregates as well. So follow us on your favorite social media platform, like us on Facebook, like us on Instagram, or contact us directly either at utelight.com or with our email address. We'll be happy to give you more information or more technical, anything more technical you may need. And with that, we will Thank you for joining our webinar. Like us on Facebook, contact us directly. Directly, We'd be happy to help you with internal curing or any other questions you may have for structural lightweight aggregate.